Today is 12-21-12, and this is part two of the Judgment Throne Brings the Divine Credentials. At the end of December of 1989, my wife and I and our daughter Angie, who was a toddler at the time, went up to Virginia to visit her father. Uh, we weren't very far from Downingtown, Pennsylvania, where Teresa Moore lived, so we decided to drop in on her. Uh, we, I hadn't seen her since 1984, so we got to her place on the seventh day of Hanukkah. Teresa greeted us uh, very cordially. Uh, we spent a couple of days with her there, and um, we basically talked about what had happened uh, throughout the history uh, of the uh, Branch Davidian movement, especially uh, the events that took place in, uh, you know, 1984. Now, <clears throat> Teresa Moore did not know that I had given a three and a half hour study because she had left Mount Carmel because she was not happy with the way things were going and she saw that Vernon was um, basically taking up most of the time and she wasn't able to basically tell what she wanted to say uh, and so she got upset and left by bus and went back home. So she and another person, Doug Mitchell, did not um, actually hear the three and a half hour study that I had given um, to the group there about the Omega of apostasy. So these two individuals were not present to see me point my finger at David Koresh and declare to him that he was going to receive the judgments of God, the Ezekiel 9 slaughter. They did not see that. But Tom Caldwell did. And Tom Caldwell wrote about it in the Jonah Messenger. Because if you see, uh, you know, in the middle of that, the judgment for the living, in that where there's a cross, 1977 to 1984, the Jonah Messenger had to come in 1981 at Passover. And it was me. I started teaching the Holy Spirit daughter message when I was in Canada with the, with the other, with the women up there. And they were agreeing with it. They liked it. They thought it was fantastic. They told Lois and she said, shut up. I don't want you talking about this anymore. And I didn't understand why. But that's okay. It's all water under the bridge. I was able to come back in 1984 to defend Lois, you see, and to show her that it was not her that was going to bring forth this child. That it was the Holy Spirit. And that child is going to be a child of a son of Adam that is going to be born again through baptism of the Holy Spirit. Okay? In a message first and then in reality. He's going to be anointed by the Holy Spirit herself. And Lois realized that I was teaching the truth. Vernon realized I was teaching the truth. And Lois said, you both have the truth. One's coming from one side and is teaching the mystery of iniquity. And the other one, you, Charles, are teaching the mystery of godliness. And it was like when Ellen White saw Jones and Wagner, they came with a message about the righteousness of Christ and the kingdom of God and how it was going to be obtained. You see? And they basically were ridiculed rejected and made fun of by the majority but that message would return and do its work so in 1984 Vernon and I looked at each other and I said you're the guy that's going to do this and he says yeah you're the guy that's going to do this and I said he hugged me and said this brother's teaching truth it took me a while to understand what he was doing because it was so uh, diabolic and so foreign to me that I couldn't imagine that the Lord would do such a thing. But he did. He took on sin, didn't he? 
He took on sin, didn't he? Didn't the Lord take on sin? Okay. He had to take on sin again, but this time through his corporate body, for all corporate bodies. He did it for each individual 2,000 years ago. Yes, we've all been bought with a price. We've all been saved, okay, if we want it. But what about the churches? What about the organizations? What about Israel? You know, the kingdom of Israel. Right? The Jewish church that fell away from righteousness when he came, okay? And they crucified him. Well, what about that? Can they be forgiven? Yes, they can be forgiven. Because it says, you know, the uh, uh, natural olive tree, all the branches are going to be broken off, but they're going to be grafted back in. And the wild branches of the wild olive tree, okay, which is us, are going to be grafted in that too. So, I'm thinking, how are you going to do this, Lord? How are you going to do it? Well, in the fall of 1989, during the Feast of Tabernacles, Teresa Moore and Tom Caldwell went to Israel, and they were on the top of the Mount of Olives. Tom Caldwell took a picture of the sky. He just did it. Didn't know why he did it. He just did it. He developed it, and he thought there was something wrong with the film. There was something wrong with the picture, because there was a a stone about the size of a man's hand, like it describes it in the scriptures, when the chariot of God comes. And he took the picture, and he said, I don't think it was there at the time. I said, maybe it was there, Tom, but you didn't see it, and it didn't come down all the way, because it's a prophecy. And it's just like what happened with Florence Hodiff. They were right about the time, but wrong about the event. But they knew it had to do with the kingdom of God. So you can't really blame them. And you can't really blame her for starting to sell Mount Carmel. But they weren't supposed to pocket it. And when they saw that Ben Roden had land ready for them in Israel, they should have been smart enough to realize he's the next man in line. Some did. Only seven men did. The rest of them went back into the world and went back into the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Am I right? Yeah. And they burned all their books. Talk about a slaughter. You see? Okay, so now, what happened in 1989, Passover, Atonement, that had to do with what Florence Hodiff did in 1959? but only 30 years later in the judgment for the living. So how does this relate to uh, what happened with Florence Hodiff? Well, <clears throat> Tom had a dream in late uh, 1989. Uh, he saw antlers laying on the ground. Now, caribou or reindeer are the only species of deer that both the male and female have antlers. The male loses its antlers in the spring and the female loses her antlers in the late summer or early fall. And that's basically when the males rut with the females or mate with them. Why do they lose their horns? So they don't hurt the male when he's rutting, when he's the boss. You understand what I'm saying? Or they won't have any kids. Now when she's pregnant, she has the horns. But when she needs to be serviced so that and get preg impregnated, he has the horns. So these horns on the ground, okay? Remember that. I'll get to it in a minute. Or we went to uh, uh, her place, and it was around Han. It was at Hanukkah time, so it was a, you know, when the reindeer doesn't have any horns, the female, and we went to see her. And she, uh, like I said, she was very cordial, very loving. Uh, uh, you know, we, we talked a lot about a lot of things, but mostly about what happened in 1984. And she showed me, she believed that nothing was going to um, happen anymore at Mount Carmel. That's what she said. 
I said, how can you say that? She said, well, see this, see this uh, place we looked out the window and we looked up on, on a hill. And she says, I'm believing that that's uh, where God's going to relocate. And it was acreage with, uh, you know, buildings on it. And uh, it never did happen. She never acquired it. Downingtown, Pennsylvania. That's where she had her ministry. And she called it Lords of Sabbath are Righteous Branches. It's a nice name. It's good for maybe publishing. You see? But it's not inspiration. Because that's not the next name. That's not the name that bears the divine credentials. According to the bylaws of the church. And according to the genealogy through which the anointed ones have to come. I have, when Lois Roden died, I took the name Living Waters Branch of Righteousness. And she was Living Waters Branch. And I said branch of righteousness. And I added branch of righteousness. Because when Ben Roden died, the General Association of Branch Davidian Seventh-day Adventists was defunct. You can't take it that name. That was his name. It only belonged to him. Just like the General Association of Davidian Seventh-day Adventists was Brother Hodges. Nobody else can take that name unless they're a president. And this is what I find wrong with most Davidian ministries. According to the bylaws, they should have a president, not a vice president, uh, leading the church. And the bylaws state that he has to be an anointed and appointed by the Lord himself. In other words, they have to bear the divine credentials. They have to come on time, they have to have a message, and that message has to be congruent or coherent with the previous messenger. And according to what Lois taught in the Protestant uh, parsonage, you have to be married. I don't think a single individual can represent uh, the church properly. When we arrived at Teresa's house in 1989, we arrived on the seventh day of Hanukkah and she was about to light her candles at sundown. When she had us there light, lighting the candles, the eighth candle lit up on its own. Eight is the number of new order or new beginnings. And what I'm trying to show here is the transition. The two sticks in Ezekiel's hand represent the two branches that are uh, in charge or that lead the church. And Ezekiel represents the son of promise that has the two sticks in his hand. These are the divine credentials that are given to the one that the Lord anoints. The day after this young man, Charles Pace, got married, Lois Roden came to their household and blessed him and his wife as the new leader and representative of the church. This took place two months before Lois had died. And when she did die, she placed Teresa Moore and the women in charge of the publisher. She wasn't leading the church because a man leads the church. The Protestant parsonage is a man and a woman married. A man and a woman married. That's the Protestant parsonage. You can't run the, you can't be the Protestant parsonage if you're single and you can't be the Protestant parsonage if you're not married. You can't be a group of women. You can't be a group of men. You must be married, and you must represent Christ and the Holy Spirit, daughter. Ben and Lois represented Christ and the Holy Spirit as the father and the mother, Adam and Eve. Antitypical Adam and Eve. But they had to have a son, a righteous son. And it wasn't their own son, George. Everybody knew that. That's how Vernon was able to, you know, get the executive, Lois's executive counsel, because she kept thinking it was going to be George. And he talked her into believing that it was going to be um, a son that's going to come from her own womb. And that didn't happen. Now, you've got to understand that Tom Caldwell is privy as a witness to all these things that I'm telling you about. In person, he's a witness. And I believe God raised him as a witness. That's what he is. is a witness. And he's a scribe. 
to write it down. And he was with he was with uh, uh, Teresa Moore. And then in 1989, after we were with Teresa Moore, it may have been in the spring of, of uh, it may have been in January of 1990 that he got a hold of me, and he sent me the pictures. And I told him, I said, Tom, this is the Lord's judicial throne coming down at Passover time in Israel. We need to go there. So we went. And when we went, see, Tom was trying to get Teresa Moore, remember the baker's uniforms, or the, excuse me, I shouldn't say that. The ascension robes for the priests. He said to her, you need to give that seventh one because there were six of them. Six is the number of men, okay? I mean, it's just so obvious to me that it was, you know, God was telling a story here. So she says, no, I'm not going to let him have it. So he said, why don't we all go together to her? We'll book the flight. We'll all go together. We'll all be there together. No, I don't want to go with him. See? So Tom decided to not go with her this time and go with me. Why? Because of the the huge weight of evidence that uh, Tom saw that I had, okay, because of what I was teaching. And he was really turned on uh, by what I taught in 1984. And he realized, oh my goodness, uh, we need to go. I think Charles is right. She has been wrong twice already. And he saw, I'm going to go with him. Because he was spurred in his spirit to go with me because he saw what I taught in 1984 and what I was able to do. You see? And uh, he was there when I was anointed by Lois. He wrote all about it. Wrote a historical account. And I believe the Lord sent him there. He sent us together. I don't want to say he sent me and he didn't send him. He sent us together, okay? Because that's what this is, you know, little touchy feel feelings here. Uh, we all we both went together because the Lord told us to go. And he sends you two by two, Tom, anyway. Two by two. And if you can't go two by two, he's not going to send you all by yourself. He won't send you unless he can send you with someone else. Because he has to have a witness. Do you want to understand this? And he, everything he does, you have to have two or more witnesses, right? Two or three witnesses. is something established. So I was a witness, the true witness, because I was the one doing it. And he was the witness. And witnessing me doing it and writing it down. So that it won't be forgotten. And Tom is very good at writing things down. Okay? I mean, he can write and write and write and write. And he loves it. I can't stand writing. I've got to talk. That's my forte. When I spoke the message, he knew that I had the anointing. You see? He knew it. And I know it too when I have the anointing. That I have the anointing. Because I know I didn't prepare for this. I didn't, I didn't know that what I was going to say. And I've got to tape stuff so that I can learn what I said and how it came about. You see? So, we go to, we go to Jerusalem for Passover. The main thing on this chart, okay? Teresa Moore went there too with another woman and a child. And she thought, we went to the very top where he took the picture to greet because when you look at the picture you just look between two incense cedars and you see the Merkab the throne and you see a bunch of other uh, uh, like little uh, spaceships behind it and uh, that was the angels the cloud of witnesses came down with him the Lord 
And so, both Tom and I knew that we were there at the right place at the right time. You understand? To do what we needed to do. I did the officiating and he did the reporting. Okay? Because it was a revelation and a report. But the revelation the Lord was giving me. Now what does this all mean? What am I trying to say here? Well, in 1959 when Ben Roden came from Israel and told Florence to go back to Israel, sell all that they have and go back to Israel. She wouldn't do it. So God was showing them the Davidian Seventh-day Adventists that Ben Roden was the next anointed leader. Whether they liked it or not. And he told them, I'm going to be in and you're going to be out. Whether they liked it or not, they were. He was in and they were out. Whether they liked it or not, they were trying to sell all the property. But he was able to stop and buy the center, you know, where all the buildings were and the, and the headquarters was, of the 960 acres. So, the two men that sell all that they have and buy the field, Victor Hodiff, Ben Roden, Jones and Wagner. This is how we're going to get into the kingdom. They came and brought us the, the truth about the kingdom. Jones and Wagner. And it had to be repeated again. And again. And again. Until it will do its work. So now we have Lois Roden. Okay. We had Lois Roden in 1984. And this is when the Jonah messenger had to come with the Jonah message. Because he's three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Three years. After three years, I had to bring the message to Nineveh. And Nineveh is the capital city of Assyria. And Assyria is English-speaking Protestant nations and denominations. It's the dispersed of Israel. The United States and her allies. Britain and her allies. Same thing. English-speaking Protestant nations. And Brother Hodef says that they're the descendants of the apostles. Okay? So it's the Christian church, the true Christian church. And Nineveh would be headquarters. So I had to go to the kings of Nineveh with the Jonah message, as the Jonah. And by the way, my family crest is a dove, and Jonah means dove in Hebrew. And it's a female dove. It's an A-H ending. So I came here or really and truly the Holy Spirit sent me here because she had the branch in her mouth and that was me. The branch. The branch of peace, you know. The dove of peace. That's on my family crest. So, in 1990, the Lord sent me with a witness, the same witness that, that she had Teresa Moore had with her. Okay? See, God's wonderful. God's true. And he went there with me and he realized, you are the leader. You're the leader and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to declare that you're Joshua. And he anointed me as Joshua because he realized that. And he was a witness, see? And the Lord was a witness of his witness. And Tom made a vow when he said, you're Joshua, I'm going to anoint you. He was telling the Lord, I believe in the servant that you've chosen. Amen? Amen. Now, those antlers that he saw were female antlers because they fall off in the fall. The female antlers fall off in the fall. They were Teresa Moore's. She no longer is to put herself up as a leader. And she still, to this day, is trying to stop me from being who the Lord has anointed me to be. And now she's using Tom and Linda. It's because she's convinced Tom again that I'm not the leader for some stupid reason that doesn't make any sense to me. 
that's got to be demonic. You see what I mean? So, in 1990, the judicial phase of the judgment began. And it was about the branch is the judge, the Holy Ghost, the only intercessor. Who's the judge? The branch. The man whose name is Branch. And Tom acknowledged it. He said, you're Joshua. Well, when the Lord takes the reins into his own hands and he says, uh, Joshua is the highest official in the church. Right? The highest official in the church. And he is the one that's going to loosen the bind. Nobody else. Whatever is loosed on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Whatever is bound on earth shall be bound in heaven. And he's the only one that has the garment changed. Nobody has the garment changed but him. Because I gave him the garment change. I took away his iniquity. Why? Because I sighed and cried for the abominations that were being in the, done in the church. From 1980 to 1984 and then again in 1990 because I sent the revelation of Jesus Christ and his righteousness which is what the Lord inspired me to write while I was in Israel or you know I got I got the information in Israel and I wrote the book and I sent it to Vernon and his men here at Mount Carmel for them to read it. And Clive Doyle sent me a letter. I got it on the 27th of February, 1993. And he basically said, well, all of this is basically what you taught in 1984. Well, why would it change? When Vernon said, you're teaching the truth. <laughs> See, why would it change? When Lois agreed with it, she's, she was the spiritual leader. And even Vernon, your spiritual leader, agreed with it. Why would it change, Clive? You're the one that has to change. You see? Because it's the truth. And it still is the truth. So help you God. And so, in 1990, you see, that message was given. And I gave the message to Teresa Moore. Because I came down from the mount, from the top. And I met her part of the way down. She was on the lower side. I was on the upper side. And I looked at her. She looked like she looked wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. You know what I mean? Her makeup, her mascara was she was sweating. She wasn't crying. It was running down her face. So she looked like she had two black eyes. And her wig, you could see her hairline, because her wig was back here. And I could see uh Pardon the, I mean, I saw the whore of Babylon and how the church is going to look because of their private interpretation. And uh, all she could say to me was. scathing rebukes and I just looked at her there was a stream of water flowing between us and I just looked at her and I said I told you the chariot is not coming here the chariot is going to come at Mount Carmel center and take us from there and bring us to here that's what's written and that's what's going to happen and you're not going to change it because you just don't want to have anything to do with Mount Carmel anymore. And that goes for you too, Tom. It's not going to change. This place has been bought so that it can be sold. Or we could sell all that we have and uh, inherit the kingdom here so that we can go not to Israel. We're going up. We have to go to a wedding first and then we come back down to, we come down to Israel and set up the kingdom. But we've got to go to heaven first. And we've got to go and get the bride first. You see? 
And, um, you know, while we were there, I, I knew Tom took me to a place in the city of David, and I felt the presence of the Holy Spirit. I later discovered that the man that I we met in the church, uh, you know, when they were having communion at the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and we were washing one another's feet, and I met the guy, uh, Ken Godfrey. I met him again at my sister's apartment because I didn't know I was going. See, my sister asked me because she didn't know how to run a computer and he didn't know how to run a computer and they wanted to publish the study on where the Ark of the Covenant is. And I said, of course I'll help you. I'll bring my computer up there and I did. I spent a month and a half up there writing and you know, and talking to this guy. He was the same guy that was in Israel. How could that happen? And he's right there with my sister. It's unbelievable. Tom wasn't there then. He was there at the church. So he's a witness, see? That we met the man. He wrote it down. See? But I'm the one that sat with him and discussed this whole thing about the ark. And I'm the one that has the study. I've got the study. See? And just because I've given people the study and I've taught them, they don't need to usurp my position as the high priest because they're not going to go there. I'll guarantee you no one is going to go in there unless I'm with them. You understand that? Because the Lord's sending me to get the bride. That's his wife. And I'm his best friend. And the only people that I want with me, Tom, are my best friends. Not my enemies. So you better be my best friend. We better make up. We better reconcile. If you're going to the wedding. If you're not going to the wedding, well, that's fine. You can stay and go through the tribulation and be a part of the 144,000. But I'm destined to be in the bridal party. Are you? Where do you want to be? It's your choice, folks. Honestly, it's your choice. Oh, and yes, uh, you're going to have to uh, put away your preconceived ideas, habits, and practices because the Lord is going to teach the Sabbath and the sanctuary more fully. And you might be finding, you may find out that you shouldn't be keeping the Sabbath according to the Gregorian calendar week. And don't tell me I'm not going to reconcile with you because you're keeping the wrong Sabbath. I'm keeping the Sabbath that the Lord has shown me in my heart of hearts that is the true Sabbath. And if it happens to be Sunday, well, I worshipped on Sunday before, and he still saved me. You understand? He made me a Seventh-day Adventist and a Branch Davidian Seventh-day Adventist after the fact that I worshipped on Sunday. Okay? But I was worshipping another God. See, now I know who the true God is. The King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And he knows that he could tell me the truth about the, about, you know, the seventh day. And that the man of sin thought to change times and laws. And he put his Lord's Day on the Lord's Day. And tries to claim it. His identity. Tom, don't try to steal my identity, please. Don't try to steal my identity. I'm the high priest. You are a priest, Tom, but you're not a high priest. And you have to let me anoint you this time. It's not like John anointing Christ because he was declaring that he was the Lamb, the Messiah. This is different. This is an anointing that breaks the yoke of the Assyrian. And you're under the yoke of the Assyrian, Tom, if you're still worried about your money and your bank account. Because it says that those that will put away their idols of silver and gold. And I say if they, you need to put away your idols, uh, your ideas, your idol ideas, you see. And if you don't do that, well, then you're going to end up um, 
having to go through the grave because the only way that God can save us is if we give up everything, sell all, and buy the kingdom. And the kingdom happens to be Mount Carmel, Tom. New Mount Carmel. It's no other place. Because we, wave sheaf, are going to buy the kingdom with our blood, sweat, and tears. We're going to give up everything that we have. We're going to be crucified with Christ. And we're going to be we're going to look at that brazen serpent, not the cross, Tom, it's the brazen serpent. It's what Moses had to lift up because of the, um, uh, they wouldn't respect his authority. So they were all bitten by the devil. They were all poisoned. Their thinking was poisoned. Their uh, supposed love for one another was poisoned made them bitter because that's what poison does it makes you bitter and if you cannot if you cannot have a sweet uh, um, countenance because of the butter and the honey that we eat so that we can choose the good and refuse the evil and by the way Tom I've been uh, officiating at the communion service a bread that is buttered and honeyed ever since you left. And maybe that's why you can't choose the good and refuse the evil. So you need to come back and start eating the butter and the honey. I'm the only one that can administer the butter and the honey. And you look at the uh, chart of the universal dairy, Tom, and you scathingly said that this is not a one man show from what I see it is a one man show because the Lord can't trust anybody else he can't trust anybody else and that's why he takes the reins into his own hands don't you understand that he takes the reins into his own hands because he can't trust anyone else and he anoints and appoints his vicegerent he gives him power of attorney. He makes him the highest official in the church. He's judge and ruler. So, Tom, I don't want to have to judge you. And I don't want to have to rule over you either. I want the Holy Spirit to. And the Holy Spirit will do it in love and in uh, compassion and in mercy and in grace. Don't get, you know, don't let me have to judge you or the Lord have to judge you because it's not going to be that way. He's going to slaughter. He's going to spew out. But if you're zealous and you repent, well, then you have her. Uh, you give the credit to her because uh, she's finally uh, enlightened you or you finally listened to her small, still voice trying to enlighten you as to, you know, what the truth is. Now look at the chart, Tom, and uh, see it for what it really is. Now the executive phase of the judgment came in 1993 with the slaughter of Ezekiel 9, right here. And it was the judgment that I pronounced on Vernon Howell, who became David Koresh, in 1990, by the way, because he was given a chance to repent. Uh, and of course, we knew he wasn't going to repent because the Lord had to make this all happen the way it happened. But he was given a chance, you see, because the Lord gives you a chance. There has to be a moral reason why the Lord had to slaughter these people. And it's because he would not accept the revelation of Jesus Christ and his righteousness. The voice of the seventh angel. And when the voice of the seventh angel begins to sound, the mystery of God is finished, we're told. So the mystery of God is finished. The atonement is about to be finished. Now, we had two fig trees. One was shriveled up and, it, and, and, and what what the Lord pronounced on that fig tree, which is DSDA, 
But don't forget that Teresa Moore had the antitypical fulfillment of that. So that organization that she set up is never going to bear fruit. Because that's what he, that's what that's the judgment that the Lord pronounced on that fig tree that didn't have fruit when he came to eat. So when I came to eat, Tom, from from uh, 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 Teresa Moore, I went to her place. You know what she said I did, or she thought I did when we left. She thought I poisoned her. And she's been telling everyone that I tried to kill her and poison her ever since. She still hasn't gotten over it. And what she did, Tom, she let the demon, she let the devil, that old serpent, the devil, bite her, and she poisoned herself. Because you see, I'm a naturopath. I understand how the body works, and you can't, you know, eat meat, smoke, and uh, drink coffee, and then go on a three-week fast and expect not to poison yourself, unless you're drinking plenty of water and taking clonics and you're uh, getting rid of uh, the uh, poisons that the liver and all the uh, organs are throwing off into the bowel. And if you look like, uh, you know, the Pillsbury Doughboy, uh, when you're doing this, you're not going to effectively be cleansing. So she got sick. I didn't poison her. My wife did not poison her. And little Angie didn't poison her either. It's all in her head. But that's where most of this stuff is. It's all in her head. Okay? Now, if you want to listen to her, and if you want your wife to listen to her, rant and rave about me, go ahead. I do not care. But I am warning you. And I warned you by telling you what happened to Doug. So I'm going to ask you, Tom. If you do die, would you like to be buried at Mount Carmel? But I'd like to raise you from a life of sin and death. I'd like to raise you from, you know, being dead in trespasses and sins. I forgive you. I forgive your wife. I did it, you know, the next day. Because that's the kind of guy I am. But you don't want to reconcile. Don't ever say you don't want to reconcile. Because the Lord will hold you to it. Because that's the ministry he gave us. He left for us the ministry of reconciliation. And the reason why... And I'm telling you this, Tom, because... The survivors don't want to reconcile with me, even though I'm right. They don't want to reconcile to the fact that I own Mount Carmel now. The Lord gave it to me. It's in my name. They, they can't be reconciled to the fact that, uh, uh, you know, like you can't be reconciled to the fact that uh, uh, Ethan Slauson confessed to me that he was wrong. Who else would he confess to and who else would bear their sin but the high priest, Tom? I have yet to wait for Teresa Moore and uh, Doug Mitchell and Doug Mitchell's dying. Clive Doyle's kind of dying too because he has diabetes and his organs are falling apart. So these people that don't want to confess their sin, I have to bear it. But the way I bear it, Tom, is to try to teach you the truth. That's how I bear it. And if I can set you free with the truth, because it's the truth that will set you free. I hope I set you free uh, with this 1989 and, you know, think about Teresa Moore. Yes, I went there with you and you went with me. You're a witness. Now speak as a witness and don't perjure yourself. Because you're in, uh, you, your case is being judged, Tom. But I'm your advocate. Because I know what you did. 
and I know, and you know what I did. And I'm telling you, tell the whole truth and quit trying to hide and trying to usurp my inheritance and my position in all this because you're not going to win. It'd be like when Jacob was trying to steal his brother's birthright. And I pointed it out to you, Tom, when I was out in California. You couldn't sell, you know, the uh, the uh, trailer park out from under your brother. You couldn't do that. God was not going to bless that. And I'm glad you didn't do it. I'm glad you took my counsel. Because you were about to do it. And I know who was telling you to do it. So... I don't know what she's telling you to do now, but don't usurp and don't try to steal my birthright because you can't and you won't. That's what Korah, Dathan, and Abiram thought that they were going to do with Moses and Aaron was take away his birthright, the right that he was the leader, the president, the God-appointed president. And you know that I am, Tom. And if I am then you need to come to me because I'm the judge and ruler. And this is where the storehouse is. This is where the Lord stores the truth, but he's also going to store the treasury of the kingdom here. So, Tom, I'm going to say it one more time. And it's not... I'm not just giving this advice to you. This is what everybody has to do according to symbolic code uh, number 10. You're supposed to support the work with your tithes and offerings. But when the Lord tells you to sell all that you have and put it on the market so that you can invest that money in the kingdom and you don't have to worry about your investment, you do it before you can't sell it and it becomes a millstone around your neck. Now is the time to sell. I've been trying to tell you, Tom, and the Lord's been trying to tell you in a roundabout way to sell your property and come to the kingdom. Sell all that you have and establish yourself here in the kingdom. You're the first one that made a declaration public. A public declaration. And everyone's laughing at you now. You made a vow before God. A vow before God and witnesses. If you want this revival, reformation, and reorganization to go forward quickly so that we can bring the saints, because the Lord's delivering the saints, Tom. They're being delivered. And it looks to me like uh, Texas is going to secede from the Union after the election. And uh, you know what Ben Roden wrote about it. You know all this stuff. Texas is going to be a country. And there's going to be other states that are, tried, are going to try to secede from the Union, but they won't be able to. So the saints, God's people in all those states, are going to move to Texas, including you, Tom, whether you think you are or not. You don't want to be uh, in a town, Temecula. Do you know that Temecula has a 25,000 square foot mosque? I'll send you the video. These small towns are being infiltrated by Muslims so that they can set up their communities, their, their, their uh, country communities where nobody can see them, and they're becoming cells, terrorist cells. And you're in a town that has a 25,000 square mosque. They're building it. And that's what's going on in the United States. Why? Because of Obama. I'll send you some more information about this. But Tom, please, please, we're begging you. Don't put yourself through the tribulation. You don't need to go through the tribulation. Just confess your sin of pride. 
like Jacob. Jacob tried to usurp his brother's birthright. And I see that that's what you're trying to do to me. You need to, you need to wake up. Don't let the women lead you. Okay? You lead them into the kingdom. You need to help Teresa Moore understand this. What happened. So she's not bitter anymore. Like she thinks I ripped her off. I didn't rip her off. The Lord anointed me and appointed me. I'm not ripping you off. I didn't rip, uh, uh, you know, uh, Ethan Slauson off either. He confessed his sin to me. His sins. And we agreed. Be four days before the man died. I'm trying to get uh, uh, Doug Mitchell to confess his sin. So he can die in peace. And I said, like I said, I'm willing to bury him here. If he wants to. But you know how hard-hearted he is. Are you going to be just the same? I hope not, Tom. I really don't. Hope that you, you, you go to that extreme. That the Lord has to, you know, give you a, a, a flesh-eating virus to show you that you are taking on the curse. That you are taking on the cancer. You are taking on the leprosy that represents the sin of the General Association of Branch Davidian Seventh-day Adventists. And the Holy Spirit put it on him. You know his lungs are deteriorating, Tom? The Holy Spirit's taking her breath away from him. She's not letting him speak anymore either because he's speaking falsehood. Don't you be in that same position. You were with me when, when, when Ethan talked to me. You were with me when I told you immediately after what he said. But you, you've chosen to deny it. And as God is my witness, I'll swear, you know, I'll swear on, a, on the scriptures. I, I mean, I'm not lying, Tom. I'm not lying. I am the high priest, Tom. I can uh, help you. With your spiritual need. Okay. If you need. To overcome this addiction. That these demons. Have allowed you to. Uh, think that you. You know are starting a movement. And it starts in California. And it comes eastward. Come on. You know these people that wanted to do the um, the um, the reality documentary. They're kind of laughing at you and I, and I'm just waiting on you to get back here, because the Lord's about to blow this open. But He had to make sure that He could trust you, and I had to make sure that I could trust you and your wife. Because this is for real. And you're not going to cause the work to go your way. It's going to go God's way. Even if he has to lay you to rest or lay you sick. Lay you up sick. The Father has given to the Son all power in heaven and on earth. Tom, he's the big buck with the big antlers. He's come down to judge's house to finish the executive phase of the judgment and he's here to um, fight with anyone that's trying to usurp his authority you might think that this is a matriarchal system it's not these antlers that you saw was uh, the lord demoting uh, the sisters we don't need any more publishing doug and <clears throat> Teresa did the publishing. Doug did it electronically and she did it by actually uh, publishing. And they got full of the ashes of the red heifer. You know all about it, Tom. Now that you're publishing electronically, you have gotten the ashes all over you as well. And it's made you unclean. 
what you I, I see you striving to do is to uh, one up me. Uh, you've taken what I have taught you, what I have been writing over the past 20 years and teaching over the past 20 years. And now that you've got uh, a good um, understanding of it, because the spirit has to give you some understanding, uh, you seem to be wanting to counterfeit everything. Your website, it looks like, you know, you're giving the trumpet an uncertain sound. You're confusing people. You have pictures of, uh, you know, Mount Carmel. Uh, you have messages that have come from Mount Carmel. And, um, you know, people are out there and you're even calling people and telling them to look at all this. And you fail to realize, Tom, that this is my message. I'm the high priest, not you. You can be a priest. You can help me. Be my helper, Tom. And repent before it's too late. You and I have a great work to do. But we have to do it together. We have to reconcile with one another. And if we don't, then we don't need to call ourselves leaders. This uh, revival, reformation, and reorganization has to come. And it will come. But only if we have the fruit. You see, that's what the Lord is inspecting now is our fruit. Are you hot or cold? Well, if you're lukewarm, he says he's going to spew you out. He's going to get rid of you because you don't have the right fruit. And because you finally got a deeper understanding, because the Holy Spirit finally gave it to you after uh, about 20 years of me teaching it, now you think, because it's a revelation to you, that it's a new revelation, and it's not. It's a new revelation to you, Tom. Now, what you're doing is causing people to be confused because uh, you're, um, rather than being my helper, you're being my hinderer. Now, you've done all these things with me, Tom, as a witness, because that's what the Lord did. He had you come forth as a witness. Because there has to be two or more witnesses to establish a matter. Now, because you have electronically bound together the testimony as well, but you've got everyone's. You've got uh, uh, basically uh, uh, everyone that ever wrote anything. So you've got the ashes now. You've got the doctrines. Now, what you're going to find when you read the um, the red heifer sacrifice in Verity is that the one who gathers the ashes becomes unclean. And the only way that they can become clean again is to have the water of separation sprinkled on them by the high priest. In other words you're going to have to allow Joshua to straighten your perverted thinking by feeding you the butter and the honey so that you can choose the good and refuse the evil. He also is the one, when you come into the land, sprinkles you with clean water to take away your uncleanness because you've touched the dead. Yes, you're dead in trespasses and sins. Why? Because you're going back to the um, teachings of the dead prophets. And the Lord wants to progress. He's always progressed, even with the reformers. So he, re he progresses with his uh, prophets that are, pol are teaching polluted doctrines. So these doctrines have to be purified. The only way they can be purified is by the one that the Lord has anointed and appointed to do that very work. And that's the Joshua of today. The one who feeds the cow, the two sheep. He gets the cream, makes butter, 
gets the honey and feeds that to the people on the communion. And the only place you're going to get that is here at Mount Carmel, Tom. So you've got to come into your own land so that you can be sprinkled with clean water. The Lord can take away your stony heart and give you a heart of flesh. And then he'll put his spirit within you so that you can walk in his ways and keep his statutes and judgments. But it's not going to happen anywhere else and by anyone else. And you cannot do it for yourself. You cannot sprinkle yourself. You cannot anoint yourself. And you cannot be a self-appointed prophet or leader or teacher of righteousness. The Lord has to anoint you and appoint you. Now, I can anoint you, Tom, but you have to come here and you have to live here. Tom, in December of uh, 2010, you made a public declaration and basically swore from Scripture and made a declaration that you were the first one to be a citizen of the kingdom. And you know that the kingdom is being set up here at New Mount Carmel Center. And you know that the Lord has placed his name here. He's placed his vicegerent here. Blessed are the feet of him that publishes peace, that bringeth glad tidings. O Judah, keep thy solemn feasts and perform thy vows, for the wicked shall no longer pass through thee. Tom, you've made a vow. As the highest official in the church, I am going to ask you to perform that vow before God and before all these people that have publicly seen you and witnessed this. I'm going to tell you now, Tom, there's a lot at stake here. You are going to be the first one. Yes, you are Zerubbabel, uh, a seed from Babylon that is the first to come out of Babylon. You are going to lead out Tom and you're going to be the example to each and every citizen of the kingdom of God that is going that is being established here at Mount Carmel you are the first to make the move Tom in 1995 I made my move I brought my family here to Waco and we've been here ever since we've acquired the property uh, we are doing the Lord's work and I am continuing my wife and I are continuing the work that Ben and Lois established here but we need helpers Tom the Lord has named you as my helper you need to get your house in order you need to sell all that you have and buy the kingdom you are going to be the first one to uh, show as an example to others other than my wife and I and my family to do what God asks and the Lord will bless and this work just like Ethan Slothson said this work that the Lord has given to me here at Mount Carmel is going to be a great work and there are going to be many that are going to be gathered here Tom you need to understand that this truth, this message, this great revival, reformation, and reorganization worldwide, this move of God, depends on you and I and our families and how we are going to treat one another. I desire to reconcile with you. The Lord desires for us to reconcile with one another. If you and I, Tom, cannot reconcile with one another, we do not need to declare ourselves as those that are at the head of the work because we are not able to do what the kingdom of God requires of each and every one of us, and that's to reconcile with one another, to love our neighbors as ourselves, and to love God with all our heart, mind, and strength. That means we are obedient to His will and his will is that we reconcile with one another that we love one another and that we be an example even to our enemies and those that despitefully use us that we can love one another 
as God has loved us and put away our differences and become one body, one mind, and have one spirit among us. And that is the spirit of agape love. Now that, Tom, is how we overcome the devil and his angels. And we take their place. And we have a right to the kingdom of God. The kingdom is given to him whose right it is. And only those that can love as Christ has loved us and are willing to put away their differences of opinion, their pride, their arrogance, their self-righteousness, are going to be able to overcome where Lucifer couldn't. Lucifer could not do this, Tom. And he became the Lord's enemy, his adversary. Why? Because he wanted to be equal to him. This is why the Lord has set up a vicegerent. It's Christ and the messenger whom he send, sends. And this vicegerent is Joshua, the highest official in the church. The one that the Lord has taken the reins in his own hands through. And he says to each and every one, this is my vice Jarrett. He is the one that has a garment change. And if you think that he has not got the garment change, then you don't have it either. That is what Satan could not do, is humble himself and admit that the only begotten Son of God ruled over him. And he had, by appointment of the Father, a higher name than all the angels. And so it is with God's chosen and anointed and appointed vicegerent. Well, now don't forget Ellen White, Jones and Wagner, Victor Hodoff, Ben and Lois Roden, and even Vernon were considered the Lord's vicegerents when they were given the office of the spirit of prophecy. But there's one difference today, and that's that we are learning through the Joshua of today who is to take her rightful place as the spirit of prophecy. And that is the Holy Spirit, the Lamb that is in the midst of the throne. She is the one that's worthy to open the book. And she only is worthy to open the book. And no man that is you and I, Tom, no created being is worthy to open that book unless she and he appoint them. No scripture is of private interpretation. That's the lesson we all have to learn to overcome where Satan fell. The Lord only works with those that he has chosen and he's given his divine credentials to. No one can usurp that. And when those credentials are given, the traveling throne is always present. Please look for a conclusion in part three. It'll be a summary. Thank you very much.